to Kosai Poetry. Thanks to those of you who've zoomed in and those who are watching on YouTube. We meet either physically or virtually on the second Tuesday of every month to celebrate spoken poetry. I'm Diane Lee Mumi, and Steve Long and I are your hosts this evening. Our featured poet event is being recorded and streamed live onto YouTube as we speak. So anyone can look at it later. We'll be posting the link on our website, coastsidepoetry.org. This evening, we welcome Berkeley poet David Rosenthal. David works as a public school teacher and instructional coach. His poems and translations have appeared in Rattle, Measure Review, Birmingham Poetry Review, Teachers and Writers Magazine, The Rising Phoenix Review, Raintown Review, Sparks of Calliope, and many other print and online journals. He's been a Howard Nemiroff Sonnet Award finalist and a Pushcart Prize nominee. He's the author of the collection, The Wild Geography of Misplaced Things from White Violet Press. You can visit him at davidrosenthal.weebly.com. Please welcome David. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I was uh, muted for a moment. Um, thank you so much, Diane. Thank you, Steve, for hosting this and, and holding this space for, for poetry and, and for inviting me, inviting me back, really, because I was here before when we had the um, sonnet uh, salon a, a while back, which was a lot of fun. And I'll be, I'll be reading some sonnets tonight as well. Um, mo um, I'm, most of the poems I'm going to be reading tonight are, or a lot of the poems I'm going to be reading tonight are fairly new poems um, that I've not read before um, publicly or, and or have not published. Um, but the caveat there is that I'm slow and unprolific. So new is like, could be as old as five years old. I don't know, um, but sort of new, relatively new. But I'm actually gonna start with some older poems that I have read before and have been published just to kind of, as a, as a kind of invocation of the moment. Um, these are poems I've written that are sort of timely poems, I guess. And um, I'll start with one that I wrote a few years ago. Both of these are poems that I, I wrote and looking recently at them realized that while at the time I thought they were sort of in a moment, they actually still, for me, speak to the moment we're in. So the first one is called Life in the Time of, and then there's a blank line. And you can fill in the blank. Life in the Time of. The flags were at half mast again, beneath the freeway colored sky. He'd half expected it, but then could not remember why. He made lane changes and left turns and finally reached the parking lot. How strange the things a body learns to do without a thought. He parked, but let the engine buzz a while and sank into a stare. He never wondered where he was, just how he'd made it there. The engine idled buzzingly. The gray took hold of either eye. He tried to think of it, but he could not remember why. Um, the next one is I wrote um, in spring of 2020, just when lockdown started. And um, Newverse News made a little meme out of it for me um, online. But uh, it's funny reading this. I, 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 I really thought it was topical at the time. And again, looking at it now, it still seems to mean something. So it's called distancing. How strange to check the sky 
and see the solemn serif edges of the typeface of the history we're living, towering above these pages that we illustrate with scenes of panicked quickness and paralysis. We pendulate. It's hard to find a place to stand that's six feet from humanity, but still somehow within the range of comfort, care, and sympathy, aware that everything must change. So you might have detected already that I, um, I am what they call a formal poet. <laughs> I write in meter and rhyme. Um, and you'll hear that as we go through these. And I write small little little poems usually. So um, so they'll go by quickly. So that's just a warning. Um, so this next poem is another short little ditty like the first two, but um, I think a kind of an antidote to those when we thinking about the times we're living in. Um, this is a, a poem I wrote. Uh, for my wife, for an art project she's working on, she's a she's a big fan of lichen. She collects pictures of lichen and loves to see lichen when we go hiking. And um, so this is about a trail in Point Reyes um, that had a bunch of lichen. It's called Along the Bear Valley Trail. The lichen hangs in tatted bunches seeming fragile, though the breeze can barely sway it on the branches of the lower trees. And while there are some lonely tufts, most of what is on the ground still clings to branches stronger gusts some time ago had downed. And some spreads flat on fallen lifeless trunks or stones set in repose to patinate the lifelessness with something that still grows. Um, now I'm gonna move into some more recent poems that I, I've been very interested lately in writing these poems that are sort of character sketches that sort of imply a narrative beyond the poem. I've been very influenced um, as a poet by poet, a number of poets that do that. E.A. Robinson is someone that I have always admired. And he, he could write a sonnet that's a sort of character sketch that implies a novel's worth of narrative. Um, and that's something that's always gripped me. Also, Richard Hugo was really good at sort of describing a place in a way that, again, Im implied a narrative outside or beyond the scope of the poem. And so that's something I've been trying to work out lately. So I'm gonna read a few of those to you. Um, several of which are sonnets, as is this one. And it's called, The Way She Died. It hardly seems enough to tell her tale. There's so much more about her than her life. The teacher and the widow and the wife, an antique small town trope in modern scale. The anecdotes with which they will regale each other like the times she stood her ground for students who were bad-mouthed in the town, the times she carried soup down to the jail, will standardize. Respect will come of that. And though sometimes they'll joke about her cat and say it, it was a witch's spelling pet, they'll never really mean it. And they'll get annoyed if someone carries on too long. They'll all agree the way she died was wrong. Um, here's another of these sort of uh, character narrative sonnets. This is called The Awful Peace. He never saw it coming, but it came. She warned him every way that she knew how secret incantations of his name, the cryptographic messages, and now the end that was avoidable was here. It took him several hours to realize her absence. 
with a quickly growing fear that something happened to her. And the lies he told himself about the lies he told her didn't come to him until he found the note he couldn't bear to read. The fold was asymmetrical. He looked around a couple seconds in the awful piece, then matched the corners up to fix the crease. Um, here's another in that sort of vein. This is not a sonnet, but again, sort of um, character sketch with implied narrative. It's called Another Abad. For years, he's lived her loss this way. And he is given to routine to guide his day, like setting up the kettle for her tea and pulling back the curtains on the bay. He sits with her without her one last time, each time a little truer to the lie that this sun is the last one he'll see climb, each morning less unwilling to comply. The wrens in the arbutus make their play. The neighbor's cat makes mischief on the lawn. The sober definition of the day unfolds as daylight settles on the dawn. Thank you. I'm enjoying seeing this silent applause. It's, it's very interesting. Um, it's different, you know, in, in in-person readings, you often hear the, you, the uh, uniform hmm at the end of a poem. And so it's nice to see this uh, physical reaction. Um, okay, I'm now gonna read a poem that's actually a, a sequence of four sonnets connected. And it's uh, a little more, a little more fleshed out narratively, but still I think implies a lot beyond its own borders. Um, and uh, like I said, it's four sonnets that are connected together by repeating lines from each other. It's called Pulling Boards. It's something that his father used to do, which is to say it is an ancient thing. What fathers did, their fathers once did too, and so on. Like the never ending ring, this village has been traveling for ages. He pulls the nails straight out to use again. And if one bends, he bangs it back. The stages of the process are patterned deep as skin. He works and thinks of things he'll not recall. His memory is given to his hands while working and they sometimes take it all, the way the lake and seasons take the lands. From time to time, he holds a nail to stare at, his, at marks his father's hammer brought to bear. The marks his father's hammer brought to bear obscure the fragile archeology span the nails had borne before, as each new layer envelops and reforges history. He tosses what he saves back at the box he made last time of slats from some old bed. He misses often. Nails pile near the rocks and tools that lie behind him near the shed. The girls come back with buckets from the lake and call to him excitedly. We got some wet sand for the holes. He takes a break to thank them for their help and what they brought. Although, it's for a job that's weeks away when it comes time to mix and pour the lay. When it comes time to mix and pour the lay, the families from the row will all pitch in. It takes a week to do one house per day and one more week before they can begin to clamp and bolt the sills and stand the posts. They stagger their support for those two weeks to help each other move in with the hosts and mend some early splits to stave off leaks. But after that, save four and six hand tasks, the bulk of what is done is done alone. The help is always there if someone asks, but no one asks. 
whatever is learned is shown. Their bond is unacknowledged, but it's there. The isolation is a thing they share. The isolation is a thing they share with generations. They know what they owe. It's something that they only have to bear once every seven years and only so for 12 or 13 weeks, and then they're done. It's, a bird, it's everybody's burden, so they know enough not to complain. It's said that one is blessed to build the house that moves the row. The sun sets late and north in moving season, leaving behind a woolen alpen glow that lays his hammer down. Then, without reason, he takes one chore before he has to go. He picks up all the old nails that he threw. It's something that his father used to do. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna move away from these um, character narrative pieces for a little bit. Um, these are a couple of really recent poems that are more um, autobiographical. Um, today is actually, actually two years ago today, my mother passed away. And uh, it was a difficult time because this was, you know, uh, in the height of the lockdown period. So we weren't able to visit her in the hospital or at the care facility where she was. My brother and I um, were not able to be there with her a lot of that time. So it was very difficult. Um, but my, my mom had been in the hospital a number of times. I, she had a number of medical issues and I often was there with her, sometimes in the emergency room, sometimes in scheduled procedures. Um, and that was always an interesting adventure. She, my mom is a Stanford PhD um, who, though her body, she used to say she wished she could have a body transplant. Her, she had all these medical issues, but her brain was all the way to the end, very active, very keen. So this is a poem I wrote about her um, sometime after she died. It's called In the Hospital with Mom. They call her sweetie, miss, and dear. They mean well. She just rolls her eyes and half smiles wryly as she tries to find some bits of humor here amidst indignity and pain. At ease, she claims satirically she's here for anthropology, to study this bizarre terrain and its inhabitants and how this system functions to create a temporary social state the pain returns, she stops for now. Sometimes a doctor will appear from just behind the curtain wall and smile talk. She can't hear it all, so I repeat things till she's clear. And when they enter with the tray and peel the gown they dressed her in, attending to her weeping skin, I'll be the one who looks away. Um, so speaking of hospitals, I had an interesting experience this summer. Um, my wife and I went to Ireland to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary and had a lovely trip um, until about three days before we were supposed to come home when I had a heart attack, which was uh, an interesting thing to, to, to be a an ocean and a continent away from home and spend 11 days in the hospital in Galway, Ireland. Um, during that time, I, my wife had to sort of make a home there for herself. And after I was released from the hospital after 11 days, um, we had to wait a week before I was cleared to fly. So during that time, it was very interesting. I was supposed to take walks and sort of exercise, but I was supposed to not exert myself too much. And so we had this weird kind of existence um, during that time. So this is a, my most recent poem. 
It's about that. It's called After the Heart Attack. They walked through old lanes lined with stone and through the university down to the river. He would see the town she'd had to learn alone. The things they had to notice then, the distance back, his anxious pace, the nearness of a decent place to sit and rest in moments when a twitch would flit across his chest, which days before they would have thought was nothing. Everything is fraught with terror when one's life is blessed by saving. They stopped by a tree with lichen ravaging its bark and wondered at the pattern, stark and bold in its fragility. All right. Um, I think I have time for these last two. Um, back to sonnets. This is a, a poem that I wrote last year's anniversary for my wife. We have a, her favorite painter is uh, Marc Chagall and we have a little print of one of his paintings, um, which is of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. And I've always had a certain affinity for Bottom who's featured in the picture. So. Um, I wrote this, it's, it's called Chagall's Midsummer Night's Dream, 1939. Titania wears her eternity in white as she receives her unexpected groom. Her love will only last a spell, a night, before her blue fan sweeps it like a broom to fairy dust and Bottom's head returns to its rough weaver's homeliness. How strange he seems more worthy as an ass. One learns to be with whom one's with, to rearrange the elements of habit, drive and mind in line with love. He never was all born brute, but all his tenderness resigned itself to roles he felt unsuited for. Now, fiddler behind an angel above will ratify this temporary love. And I'll finish with one more sonnet, back to these sort of uh, character-driven sonnets. This is a narrative you'll recognize and a character I think you'll recognize right away. Um, it's called Old Jack. I've traded all my cows for magic beans. There's always someone in the marketplace who undervalues magic, which demeans the value of a cow. The time and space it takes to care for one, the land, the feed, the milking and the cleaning and the vets. They seek a profit from what others need and trade on people's dreams to hedge their bets. So I learned long ago that beans will do as well for food as magic, better so of course, and all the stories that I told of giants, of great stocks that spiraled through the clouds of golden geese were more than show. The telling of them fed me more than gold. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you so much, David. Uh, let's, let's all unmute and make noise. <laughs> Thanks so much. And um, I'd like to invite um, folks to speak. See. Thank you so much, the, David. The closest we can get to uh, an in-person thing is to, um, to unmute and speak after. It was also rich. It's kind of, it's hard to process. It means, you know, it's like, I think I want to look at the recording and kind of do this again, because even though they're short and seemingly simple, there's a whole lot there to unpack. I'll right. second that. <laughs> I'll third it. <laughs> I, I enjoyed the whole reading, David, so much, uh, but especially the, the linked sonnets. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. It, it was very compelling. You kept me engaged.
Thank you. I particularly liked uh, the reference to, <clears throat> you know, the anthropologist uh, in the hospital. Um, <laughs> I confess that sometimes I've been in strange situations and I, I kind of fancy myself an anthropologist to kind of explain, you know, how I don't really know what's going on. And I thought that was a very nice aspect of that poem. Your poem is very good. Well, actually, my, my mom was an anthropologist. Her, her PhD from Stanford was in anthropology and she taught for many years at Mills College. And so she, she really did approach things that way. I think <laughs> it, being in the hospital, which I now know from my own experience this summer, is, can be such a disorienting experience. I think thinking of things that way really helped keep her, you know, uh, agile while in the, in the hospital. And so, yeah. Well, it, 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 it creates distance without creating alienation, if I can yeah. put it that way. Right. And uh, so I, it's a habit. I, I do it a lot. But any wonderful poem. Thank you. You make me want to revisit doing formal uh, rhyming again. And I wonder, I would love to ask, I don't know if you, you probably have, don't have enough time to completely answer this, but what turned you to form, formal poetry? Or was it natural or did you reject uh, blank verse for a particular reason or time? Or did were you traumatized by, <laughs> by informal um, verse? No, okay. I, I, guess. I don't have any real sort of programmatic commitment to it. It's just how it comes to me. I, I consider it one of my many neuroses. <laughs> well, well David, so David keep keep being neurotic, my friend. <laughs> keep at it. What a what a gift you are to the poetry community. What a beautiful reading. Every poem really moved me and inspired me. And I'm just so <clears throat> so incredibly impressed. So thank you very much, David. Thank yeah, you, like like a box of impossibly delicious chocolates. <laughs> Where does one start? <laughs> well, or if Are... you eat them all and don't know what tastes were because you were just kind of trying to get them in there and hold on to them, you know? Are are these in a book, David? I um, forgot if you mentioned that or not. Yeah. <laughs> Most of these haven't been published in even in a journal yet. Um, so no, I haven't, I haven't assembled another book yet. Oh, okay. Uh, as I well, said, I'm I'm slow and I'm prolific. So, uh, well, if, if you have anything, any book already, even an older one, um, please put the information in the chat so we could um, go buy it. Yeah, I think uh, you know it's it'll be ten years old next spring. Um, um, the wild geography of misplaced things. You can. If you go to my website, which I think you can link to from the Coastside Poetry page, yes, um, yes, you can find it there. Oh, okay. None of these poems are in there, but maybe at the at the I I'm taken to believe that at the end of the open, I'll read one more and I'll I'll actually read one from the collection. Now. Yes, yes, that would be lovely if you would do that. David, where are you? I'm going to give a hurrah for slow and unprolific. <laughs> And um, also just say, there's a lot of attention to the rhyme, but I'm really taken with how beautifully modulated the meter is. Thank you. And thank you for that. David, were you able to reap a, a, a number of poems from your visit to Ireland, I wonder? Uh, did it uh, influence you in any way? Um, I, no, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't there for a long enough time to write much and uh, this event sort of overshadowed a lot of, of, of course what, yeah. what took place there. Um, I actually did while I was in the hospital try to write because I just needed things to do because the the visiting hours there were there was like two two hour windows in the afternoon so most of the time I was just sort of that was my universe so but I wasn't very successful writing in that under those conditions. Oh, well, thank you so much for your poem. <clears throat> thank you. I'd, I, like to, I'd like to offer that you're prolific in quality, which <laughs> trumps quantity anytime. <laughs> uh, thank you for that offer. That's absolutely. No. There's a it, there's something that that happens um, with form at its best 
and this is, is that the attention to every single word and how it serves, it just, it's so striking. I won't forget it soon. <clears throat> it's a its a less is more on one hand, but, but that's just, that's, that's too easy. All I can say is, boy, am I glad I heard this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I do think that's one of the things about form. If anyone's thinking about experimenting with it, when you when you commit to writing in, in meter or with a rhyme scheme or something, what it forces you to do is really pay close attention to every word and to look for, at some point you, you are looking for the word that will fit it and it moves you away from what you might have come up with before. So you find new things that you didn't expect it, you would find. And so it's a lot of fun. I recommend trying it if, you, if it's new to you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Another interesting that came, thing that came up at, um, about form at the workshop that I was at a few weeks ago at the Napa workshop was that some topics are simply too terrifying to approach in free verse and they need some kind of um, something to cling to, a structure to cling to so you can even address yeah. them. And which I thought was, was a pretty, um, pretty interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's true. I think form can kind of by itself create a, a sort of distance that allows you to address really strong mm -hmm. topics and manage mm -hmm. your strong emotions through writing it. Like the, the, the heart attack poem that I read here, you notice I wrote in third person. It's, again, creating that distance helps being able to write it. And I've heard that a lot from poets who don't usually write in form, but occasionally do. Often when they do occasionally, it's for that purpose. They're writing about really strong subjects that um, form helps them sort of regulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think that a heart attack is one of those things that makes everybody who's gone through it self-conscious. Mm. And you measure everything. And the structure helps you, whether it's whatever it is, but you see yourself from inside yourself. Yeah. And, and that never leaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well... Well, thank you again so much. We'll stop recording in a moment. And those of you in the Zoom room, please stay online if you'd like to take part in the open mic. Um, thanks to all our YouTube listeners. Please tune in for our next regular Coside Poetry event on Tuesday, October 11th, when we'll welcome East Bay poet Finn Bell. Thanks so much for joining us at Coastside Poetry and for helping to keep the lamps of poetry burning.